So I, I'm delighted to be here. I, I was thinking of the other night we had an interfaith uh, service in town. And um, uh, what an amazing town this is, isn't it? I mean, to think that so many groups have come together really to do something truly extraordinary. Uh, you know, they, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but it, this is kind of a version of that, isn't it? It takes a village to come together to be, to extend the idea of village around the world, to reach that hand uh, across the, an ocean and a continent. So it, it just, it strikes me that we have become a kind of a family. And that it's the word family that I wanted to focus on in the context of thinking about not just trauma, but what it is as we work with people from other countries and specifically, especially people from Africa. When, when um, uh, uh, actually I wasn't going to tell you the story, but I almost tripped on the cord here, so it reminds me of when I broke my foot in Uganda. Uh, I was there several years ago in just fell into a hole. It was nothing. I, I wish I had a great story to tell about how I broke it. I just stepped in a hole. And uh, immediately, I was surrounded by 50, 100 people. And they're, oh, uncle, are you okay? Father, oh, well, grandpa, uh, my brother, my son. Uh, instantly, I was somebody's relative. They, they, they can't imagine that you could be uh, in the country and not connected somehow to someone else. So you're, of course, you're my brother. Of course you're my father, of course you're my son. This is the way they think. So the notion of being connected is something we have to learn from them. And I'm anxious to learn more about that from our African friends. I know we get a whole lot more of them. Because it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see and it's, it's a way of looking at the world that I think is the root of the resilience that we see in the people of Africa who've been through these terrible experiences that Rob was just describing for us. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask the group, <clears throat> can all the people who have experienced no suffering please come up here and join me in my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> just come on up, just come right up, right up here. <laughs> right, no, no, really, I'm sorry, all the people who have never, never had a tear, never, never, no, really? <clears throat> suffering is part of the deal, isn't it? It, it's part of what life is made of. In fact, the richness of life comes from our response to our suffering and the way we respond to each other in that, that suffering. All great art, all great culture, uh, social norms come from how we respond to crisis, how we respond to trauma. <clears throat> so as a physician, I can tell you, it's an, over, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an overreach to describe suffering as a pathology, right? It's not, it's human experience. It's the stuff of life, right? <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not trying to downplay the, the, the reality that there are some very pathological responses to extreme suffering. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the, the notion that because we have suffered, we are a patient or we are a victim, that in itself is a very Western concept. And it's a very new Western concept. So it maybe robs us of some of the richness of what is possible in these experiences. When we go to Uganda, we go to refugee camps where, among other places, there are not only uh, um, uh, Ugandans of various tribes who were uprooted uh, during the Lord's Resistance Army insurgency that raged for 26 years there, but many of these uh, dis displacement and refugee camps have people from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, Sudan, Yemen. Uh, so it, it's become kind of a, a collecting place of refugees. If you look around the rim of East, Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, every single one of those countries is full of refugee camps. So not, uh, from people largely from DRC, but not exclusively. So when we go into these camps, so Margot and I have been to a, a place called Barlonio, where the worst massacre of the war, uh, of the, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army happened. Now this is this guy, who, uh, Joseph Coney, who said that the Lord was speaking to him and that he was going to take over the government. And the way he was going to do, uh, the way he was going to do it, he was going to uh, kid, kidnap children, turn them into soldiers, uh, boys or girls, and uh, the girls who didn't want to be soldiers, they could be sex slaves 
for wives for the, uh, for the soldiers. And then they were going to institute the Ten Commandments as the rule of law. <laughs> We've got a disconnect there, right? <laughs> so, so, but anyway, the worst massacre that occurred as a result of these barbarians uh, was in a place called Barlondra, where uh, in uh, 2003, uh, several hundred people were killed one evening. And so we worked with that town, or it's, it's a tiny village actually. And when we, when we talked to them the first time, I asked them, I said, well, we said that the greatest heroes come from the greatest suffering. And I would ask, who is the greatest person that you know? Who is the greatest person? In Africa, that's an easy one. Who do you think they say? Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Everybody says Nelson Mandela. Well, they're right. It's Nelson Mandela. And why is it Nelson Mandela? Well, he was in prison for 20, how many years? 27 years. And, uh, and in that time, he came out of prison and he said to himself, I knew that if, when I came out of prison, if my heart was filled with hatred and anger, that I would still be in prison. So he knew that he had to set himself to another course. If he had come out of that prison <clears throat> filled with rage and hatred, which the way they treated him, he would have been justified in feeling that, South Africa would be on fire right now. <clears throat> but one man and his vision and his commitment to that principle, his living it, transformed South Africa. Now it, it's not a perfect state by any means right now, but it's but it had a chance, right? And everyone in Africa knows that. So everyone gets that story. So I said, the, the world needs thousands of Mandela's, and they always come from places that have suffered the most. That's where Mandela's come from. They come from places where there's been terrible suffering. So who here is willing to be a Mandela for your generation? Every single kid puts his hand up. Every single kid. In any school we went to, same story. Kids been through what we would consider unimaginable hells. Every single one of them wants to be a Mandela. Every single one of them wants their suffering to mean something. Okay? So that's the other side of trauma. Right? It's, if we pathologize that, if we think of them as victims, then we have to medicate all of them. Right? Or we have to put them all through therapy when we might be you know, medicating the life out of the next Mandela. <laughs> so okay, just to give a thought. Now, I wanted to talk about family a little bit. Imagine for a second, to, to put into context what the effects of, of suffering are, let's call it unsuccessful suffering. Suffering that works its way through uh, a family and individuals in a way that are not healthy, that are not Mandela-like. Right? How does that work its way? And then how can we spot it? And how can we nurture it to go towards what we call successful suffering? So, as opposed to thinking of it as illness or pathology and, and um, uh, healing of trauma, uh, how, how can we work through the suffering in a way that's successful? So, what would that look like? Well, I want to go back to the idea of a family. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who, through one of the horrors that Rob described, was forced out of your village sometime 17 years ago with the, sh with the shirt on your back, or maybe not, and the kids are, are not in tow, and you make it through some horrific trek uh, to the next country. We, we have no idea what the story is for this family that, that preceded their arriving at the, at the refugee camp. In fact, we know nothing. I know nothing, at least, of what happened in the refugee camp. But each of these phases is uh, filled with risk and uncertainty and danger. So as a mother, as a father, what's your first concern? Yes. The kids. Where are the kids? You walk through the mall. Where's, where's, right? Just walking through the mall, your anxiety level is up because where are your kids? Where are the kids in the store? Get them over, right? So you're worried about your kids and you're worried about losing them. You're, you're worried that they're gonna, some bad will happen to them. So now this uncertainty plays itself out in lots of ways. What if some group of kids pulls your, your son away, let's say he's 16 and he's kind of attracted to a bunch of 18 year olds who are doing some stuff, and so you can't get his attention because he's off <clears throat> with these 18 year olds 
And how does that make you feel when you're trying to get through them all? <clears throat> We're helpless. A little helpless, <laughs> right? Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and if you feel helpless long enough, or if there's a little bit of rudeness or something thrown in with it, then you get angry, right, also. So in a culture where, where family is part of the water you drink, the air that you breathe, that everything is about our connectedness as family, when you find yourself in a situation where the, the, where the, the bonds of family are being strained, that is a trauma, right? to an African. Well, it's really a, a trauma to all of us. It's especially traumatic to African culture right? because that's what life is all about. They have nothing, right? They have to walk a mile for their water. They, 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 they have no money, but they've got their family. And so they can laugh about traumas and things because yeah, that's part of what they're, that's, yeah, that's what, what else are they gonna do? They've learned how to laugh about some of these horrors but they have each other and they have this sense of connectedness. One of the horrors of, in northern Uganda also was that they killed a lot of the elders. And so they, they were deliberately trying to kill off the culture in northern Uganda by killing the elders and, and with the same methods of uh, rape and, and uh, committing, having the children commit atrocities against their families so that they would break up the families and then never come back to the villages. They succeeded in many ways. Um, all right, so, but I want to get, let's, go, let's focus back on this notion of family. And, and let's begin with a, a conversation about the parents. When you've been brought up, let's say, 16 years in a refugee camp or a, a, a camp in Tanzania, and you have some exposure to the internet and some exposure to telephones, everybody's got a cell phone, uh, doing transactions on phones. But the, the, the ready access to everything on the internet is not quite the same as it is in this country. Our standards would say that's a great thing. Let's, let's get them online. Let's, you know. To them, to, to mom and dad, this could look like, oh my God, this is one more way I'm losing control of my kid, right? You know, there's this strange culture where suddenly, where's my, where's my 16 year old? Where's my 12 year old? Where's my 10 year old? Where are they, right? They're watching a screen or something. This is very American. This is not Africa, right? And it's not something that helps the family feel connected. So, and this is why I'm telling you this. All the statistics on refugee trauma, all of, this, all of the demographics uh, over decades <clears throat> shows a, 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 a huge um, uh, dysfunction that evolves between the first generation and the second generation of refugees. Right? If you're, you know about that, you've heard about that, right? Well, and it largely is this problem, that the, the kids come over and they're anxious to learn the language, they're anxious to get connected with new kids, in there, and very quickly, they get pulled away from the family, the one thing that's keeping the sanity of the parents, right? And so if you want to prevent the first layer of consequences of trauma, to any of our refugee families that come, we should do everything we can to protect the sanctity of the family. Right? And that begins with strengthening the, strengthening the authority and the prerogatives of the parents. Okay? So that they feel like they're in charge of their families. Right? So in all the things that we might see as luxuries and the things that are um, perks of life, to them might be things that undermine their role as caregiver, right? So someone who is coming to, um, you know, uh, clean the dish that you want to clean, they might see that as, well, I want, not only do I want to do it, I want my children to see that I'm doing it, right? I, I don't want this prerogative to be taken from me because everything else is foreign to us, right? So, I'm, I'm drifting a little bit, I, uh, I, I, but I do want to really emphasize this point. Um, having an eye that looks on our, on our new family members as family. You know, how, what are the things that affect family? Anything that reinforces uh, the, the proper station and respect between members of the family is a good thing, and anything that dilutes that is a bad thing. 
and it, and it can potentially lead to um, the, the negative suffering that I was referring to and the negative consequences of trauma. Now let, let's talk about what that might look like. <clears throat> One of the core problems with, with any kind of severe trauma, and when we talk about trauma, we're not talking about suffering or stress. I, I, let me make a technical distinction from what I said earlier. Technically, when you look at the, the literature, suffering is uh, a, a disruption of your normal rhythms of life, you could say, that you have to create an adjustment to in your life. You have to readjust your life to it, right? And hopefully grow as a result. Trauma overwhelms your capacity to adjust, right? You, your, your ability to deal with it is exceeded, right? So the vessel is broken, right? So you don't know how to get back to anything like a normal path of life again. So it, it's that destruction of a sense of continuity in life that defines trauma. Continuity in life. Right? So war, rape, these horrible experiences, uh, physical illness, uh, the death of a loved one, the untimely death of a loved one. Um, well, you can think of things that would be traumatic. Right? So what do people turn to when they? Well, let me uh, I'll, let me describe a little bit about about what we know about the. The, the, what we call the phenomenological experience of trauma, and then how that plays out. How am I doing on time? I, I really I do this. <laughs> yeah. I do this with medical students for hours at a time, so I can easily do this till you're, you're all asleep. So, but, uh, how am I doing? It's ten past eight. You got ten minutes? I got ten minutes. Oh, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm traumatized. <laughs> I'm traumatizing you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Keep this idea of broken continuity. All right, that's that's really a key thought. How do you how do you how do you repair the loss of continuity in your life? The loss of a vision of good. Right. I thought there was a God who could protect me and who would nurture me, but I saw my brother kill my dad, or I had to kill my mother, or I was forced to see that. Right. And how suddenly is a moral world possible? Right. When, when that's when that is in your experience, so that vision of good is broken. When that vision of the good is broken, the sense of who you are potentially breaks with it, because we really what mobilizes our sense of capacity is a vision that of something good that we'd like to attain. That stirs in us yearnings and oh, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could reach for that. And the connection between those two, the vision. And that sense of capacity, that's our motivation. So, so what happens when the vision is broken and your sense of self goes with it? I, I, I'm, I'm not this person who could do good in the world. I, I, I'm the person whose parents are killed in front of my eyes. I'm the, I'm the person who was a part of this terrible thing that happened. So the strongest emotions of your life aren't aspirations and yearnings and falling in love. They're, they're horrors. So now what goes with that? The loss of the vision and the loss of the sense of self, the noble self, our motivation goes with it. So now you meet someone who maybe you, you're, let's say you're 18 and you want to fall in love with this, this girl or this young man, and, you, and you, uh, you look at them and you think, I can never be intimate with anyone. How, how am I going to tell them that the most powerful experience of my life is seeing my younger brother's head explode? Or, right? And I'm sorry, but this is what people see. Right? Mm -hmm. Or, or that the well, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't mean to be graphic. But these experiences are translated into that sense of continuity. How do I feel like I'm a part of the continuity of the river of life? There it is, flowing right in front of me, and I'm not in it. How do I connect intimately with anyone or with a vision of hope? It becomes impossible. So versions of this are the roots of the unsuccessful nature of traumatic suffering. Right? How does that show up in a, it shows up in different ways uh, at different times in life. Um, for little kids, it's not anywhere near that emotion, uh, that cognitively evolved. But what you might see in a little kid, let's say someone you know, younger than six, 
You know, the, the six-year-old starts wetting the bed. Right? They, they, they start sucking their thumb. They start talking like they're three when they're six. They, they, they developmentally regress. That's the word for it. So they, they, they go back to a time where things seemed more coherent, like there was a time of continuity. So that's one thing you observe. Are the kids developmentally moving forward, or are they uh, frozen where they are, or even regressing? Are they becoming isolated? Are they stop? They're not playing like they used to, or uh, having tantrums where they wouldn't uh, otherwise do. Kids a little bit older. It's more behavioral stuff in the middle school kind of years, where you know uh, uh, fights with peers. Um, uh, resistance to authority, the, the things we, you know, that you can imagine. Into the teen years, it becomes a little bit, uh, you can see depression up through those times it's also. The, the verbal skills of a young person have evolved by the time they hit their teens and they can express these um, emotional movements in different ways and so that might come out as, you know, really open defiance in, in different ways. Uh, it's a huge topic and I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, so, uh, let's talk briefly about what PTSD looks like, post-traumatic stress disorder. If we think about these successful and unsuccessful responses to suffering along a spectrum, right, uh, from the pathological all the way to the Mandela-esque, Mandela right, we all fall somewhere in, in along there. And, you know, one day or part of the day we might be here, another part of the day we might be there, or in one way we're here, other ways we're there. So it's not a monolithic thing. People respond to suffering uniquely. But the, the, if we looked at just the bad thing, the, 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 that entity called post-traumatic stress disorder, that's kind of the severe end of the spectrum. But people can have variations of that all the way along until they have the full, ep the, the full entity called post-traumatic stress disorder. What are some of its features? Did, would, would this be helpful to know this? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I'm telling you anyway, so I'm not <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, there's a couple of features. The first is a sense of, you've all heard of the fight or flight response? Mm -hmm. It's the easiest way to think about PTSD. It's like you just walked into a room and there's a hungry tiger there and he's looking right at you. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, and so what happens, right? You'd want to run like crazy, right? But, ah, the adrenaline kicks in, mm -hmm. the, the, the brain stem kicks in, sends out a, a lot of adrenaline, and that, the adrenaline makes you want to do one of two things. Run or fight the thing mm -hmm. to the death, right? Because your life's at stake. So the first part of post-traumatic stress disorder is too much adrenaline running through your system. You're, you're on overdrive even when you don't need to be. So it, it's, it's like a, one of those n needles on a stereo, you know? Uh, your adrenaline's here, you see the tiger, and boom, it goes into the red zone. Then when, let's say the door closes or the tiger goes away, the, the needle can go back to normal. But when you've seen something horrible, the needle goes up and it doesn't go back all the way. So you're always nervous, you're always filled with adrenaline, you're always startled, looking behind you, wondering what's, you know, who's behind you. It takes just a tiny little thing and boom, you're right into the red zone. You know, previously it might have just done this and no big deal, but now it's any little thing and off you go. And you might become uh, uh, ragefully angry, right, or, or, or petrified, at, at just like that, right. And so those are things to watch for. Uh, sudden, um, uh, either explosive rage or brittle fear, just like that. Right? That means that nervous system is too cranked up. Sometimes you can just, you, you see that in a room sometimes in a restaurant, someone, you know, startles, and I'll say, okay, that guy's at that. You know, cause, right? Because they, they sit in the corner to, to minimize their getting startled. Right? So, um, okay, so the first part of it is this autonomic nervous system hyperarousal is what they call it. What comes with that, now the, the brain circuitry of this is another talk, but the way this works is very interesting. The parts of the brain that control our emotions and our memories are right next to each other and they're right over the part of the brain that generates the adrenaline. So as soon as you feel 
that anger or fear, it kicks in memories that are either angry or fearful. Right? So it's like we, we file memories in our brain like in little file cabinets of emotions. So every, every memory has a, an emotion attached to it. So that's why you can remember songs easier than you can remember conversations when you were a kid. It's because there's an emotion attached to the song. And so you can, the memory's right there. So, um, so all your, that when you get angry, it's like opening up the angry file cabinet of memories and all you can remember are angry things, right? Or fearful memories. All right, here, okay, I'm afraid here's the fearful memory. There's a um, fearful emotion. So here's all my fearful memories, right? Or you're in love with someone. Everything they do is just this, this an amazing thing. The, the, the way they picked up their fork is the most amazing thing that has ever happened in human history. And the, and, right? So our emotions become lenses of perception. That's the way we perceive the world, through these emotions. So what happens with PTSD, once the <coughs> hyperarousal state is kicked in, the fear and the anger drawers get opened up, and all they can remember are angry or fearful memories. So they're being bombarded with the, the horrors over and over again, playing in their memory all day long, or some for some, or, or intruding on otherwise pleasant times in their life, or invading their dreams. Okay. So that's the second thing. The re, they call that re-experiencing. Now, if that, these things are happening to you, you want to just cool yourself down a little bit and get away from this. <coughs> so there's an avoidance response. People st they try to get away from anything that will stimulate those memories. Anything that will uh, activate that adrenaline, they try to find ways to get away from it. Right? So that's the other part of PTSD, where they avoid people or situations that will remind them of their trauma. Right? So, and then there's a fourth thing that was recently added to the category that, uh, uh, for PTSD, uh, the, the definitions, that has to do with the sense of self. And I think that gets back to what I was talking about before, how that sense of vision, the sense of continuity with life, that gets broken. To me, that's, that's core to the healing. So, the easiest thing to do in trying to respond to the, the trauma of our friends from wherever, wherever we want to bring in refugees is to help them with their sense of continuity. Whether that's singing a song, whether that's, you know, it, it doesn't have to be anything, quote, medical or therapeutic. It just simply has to be heartfelt and human. Mm -hmm. And you guys are all good at that. So I, I have great hopes. All right. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> I, I would, in the same situation, have the experience that if my kids weren't, uh, you know, I didn't know where they were, or I didn't know what they were talking about, they're speaking English and I don't know what they're saying, or, or that goes on for a week and I'm kind of happy. It goes on for three months and now they're snickering and I don't know, what, are they being disrespectful? What's going on? You know, and, and that's when domestic violence uh, can occur, that when, when uh, tensions between the couple can occur. So, so really, it, it, it's not just trauma. Uh, we don't really know the experience of these folks. Well, right now they look great. But it's the socialization process into the new culture. Everything is new to them. Everything. So our interest in giving them a new novelty, it might be kind of dazzling, but, but downstream just a little bit, it can be one more thing that makes them feel completely <coughs> unrooted. And, and, and not knowing how to keep continuity in the family. So I think that's the real issue, is, is just helping the parents in particular to learn English as fast as possible, to not get behind their kids too much, um, and to you know, just nurture their parenthood. Mm -hmm.